Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And as you look at your mix of services, one of the questions you might be asking is, what do I do with endo? And so I've got one of the world's best educators on endo, and we're going to take a look at the keys to enjoying daily endodontics. So really, really interesting subject subject from Rodrigo, Rodrigo Cunha. So you don't want to miss this. Do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. And again, just having a lot of fun doing these and uh, getting some incredible people lined up, great worldwide experts on some awesome topics. And today is no exception. So you'll see why here in just a second. Um, and keep sending us subje su great suggestions for uh, future shows. Love it. And we've got them all lined up. We'll do the best we can to make them all happen. Now, couple show notes before we get started. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you have questions, feel free to add them to the feed. And then I'm going to ask Ask Rodrigo directly the question, and I'll get the answer straight from him. So, uh, and then also, if you're watching this later on and you're watching it after the live broadcast, keep adding questions, and we're going to make sure we get you the right answers so that these things are hugely valuable in your practice and your life. Now, my guest today was highly suggested from a dear friend of mine, Dr. Press Shaw. He's like, You got to get this guy out. I'm like, Who is this guy? I did some homework on you. I'm like, Oh, he's good. He's like, No, no, he's not good. He's awesome. So, um, so Dr. Rodrigo Cunha, and you are in one of one of the most incredible educators on the subject of endo. Now, I love this because we haven't had an endo expert on, and I watch people all over the world trying to do endo. Now, we're going to get into some of the mechanics of this, but before we get started, you shared with me your story. I love your story. Um, it's amazing how much education you've done over, you know, all over the world. Share with everybody your story so they get a little perspective on who you are. Okay, well, first of all, congratulations for your show. This is amazing. I've been following you for the, fa for the past few weeks, and I've been looking at some of the conversations. And honestly, I learned a lot, and I can only tell you you're doing a great job. So thank you for having me here, and I hope I can contribute to this great show that you put uh, every day over here, okay? Thank you. Um, so like we were discussing 10 minutes ago, I... I graduated in 1994 from, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Brazil, so I graduated in 1994 from the Catholic University of Campinas in Brazil, it's in the state of Sao Paulo. Since I graduated, I, I always did endodontics. I never did general dentistry in my life. Uh, I always limited my practice, even when I was a general dentist, to endodontics. Uh, in 1997, I decided to do, I finished my specialty program in endodontics. And then I went and I did my master's in endodontics as well. I finished in 2001 and 2006, I finished my PhD, all related to endodontics. Wow. I was teaching in Brazil and I also had my private practice. And after 17 years, working as an endodontics and also teaching, I decided to move to Canada. I, I always like to make fun. I moved to the North Pole <laughs> uh, in order to be a full-time professor at the University of Manitoba. So I worked as a full-time professor here. I was only doing part-time in private practice for five years. And last year, I decided to go full-time private practice. And now I'm, I am only a part-time instructor, clinical instructor at the university in the division of endodontics. Mm -hmm. During these 23 years, I carried out several research projects. I was able to publish a few. I participated in several book chapters and I've been giving CE courses all around North America, basically South America. I had a couple of chances to go to Europe and even the UAE. 
So mm-hmm. yeah, it's been busy and I still found time. I still found time to make three beautiful daughters and it was good. Everything mm-hmm. looks great. Life is great. Yeah. Three beautiful daughters. I got three of them and they are awesome. They'll take good care of you, you know, when, when you get older. So mine are teenagers. How old are your daughters? <laughs> my older one, my oldest one, she is 14. My middle one is 11 and my little one is six. So that's awesome. That is awesome, buddy. Awesome. Now, this is such a hot topic in dentistry for so many reasons. I've got some great questions I want to ask you, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this have some great questions, is the whole endo conversation. You know what I mean? Like, um, I want you to talk about why this topic is so important, some of the trends that you see, especially if you got the digital workflow going on. One of the keys, and you shared this with me, and I've known this to be true, but you're the expert in enjoying daily endodontics is case selection, right? And can you talk about why this particular subject is such a hot topic? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, Kurt. Well, in order to enjoy something, one of the first thing you have to do is you have to know what you're doing Mm -hmm. and there's nothing better than having a case that you're comfortable with and you can manage this case from start to finish. Usually, when we have a patient in front of us and we have the clinical view, we have basically a two-dimensional image in front of us. It's the radiograph. And with those two different pieces of information, we're going to try to come up with the idea if this case is suitable for me or not. Sometimes, just looking at those two pieces of information, it's not enough. I would strongly suggest whoever is listening to our conversation today, to go to the AAE website, to the American Association of Endodontics, they have this case assessment sheet. Actually, this case assessment sheet was created by the Canadian Academy of Endodontics in the early 60s, and the AAE actually tweaked it around, and now they use it, and then they spread this sheet everywhere. And I think this is one of the best ways a general dentist, a general practitioner can try to screen the case. You have several topics related to the patient, to the tooth, to the case per se. Uh, And you're going to look at several little pieces of information that they're going to be asking you about the case. And you're going to select little boxes. At the end of this whole selection, you're going to look at it and you're going to add points to the boxes you selected. Depending on the amount of points you get, it shows you that this is a simple case, a mm-hmm. case that sh- you should be more cautious with, or it's a high difficulty difficulty case that you should be referring. So I think this tool, for those that don't have a mentor that they can go to and discuss, because it's always nice to have mentors, people that went there already and might tell you, look, don't even try this case, refer. Um, this case assessment sheet is something interesting for you to look at and say, okay, this is a case that's suitable for me or not. So I think this gives you actually numbers for you to play with. And it's a great way for for you to play around and looking and screening in different cases and not start cases where you're going to say, okay, I can't finish. And now you have to refer patients usually are not happy. And I think your morale goes a little bit down. No one likes that. It's always nice to tackle something that you're able to finish it. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like it's a system. So there's, you know, how we would like data and there's no, you know, it's pretty black and white what you should and shouldn't do. Now, I told you this beforehand. I do see general dentists and others doing endo when they they on when they're honest and they say, "Look, I just hate doing it," and they're only doing it one thing for one reason for for the financial reasons. Do you see that trend happening a lot? Because we hear about it, but are you seeing that a lot? Is it a true trend or is it not? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I see it a lot, but yes, I see it. Yes, okay. I see it for sure. Actually, I, I can use myself as an example. Uh, they asked me, a lot of people asked me, why did you only do endo? When did you discover that you loved endo that much? Uh-huh. I always tell them that it was when I realized I hated everything else. So <laughs> because I 
I wasn't good at it. I didn't want to do something that I wasn't good at. I didn't feel comfortable with. Yeah. But yes, we are seeing students graduating with more debt. And I think that also plays a huge factor. I know that there are several big offices out there that are demanding their dentists to have high productivity. And endo is a way for them to increase their productivity. But at the end of the day, it's your name out there. Right. You want to, and I'm not against, I'm not against general dentists doing endo. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I think they can do, I can name you several general dentists in Winnipeg that are great clinicians and their endos are just beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's just that know the case that you can tackle and which case you should refer. I think that's the, that gray area that we should be working on. There are simple cases, and I can tell you, Kurt, I have general dentists emailing me saying, look, I'm thinking about referring you to this case. And sometimes I tell them, why are you going to refer me this case? Mm. It's a straightforward case. Managers, are, I'm sure you can do it. Right. So I'm not someone greedy for cases. We don't need that here. Actually, yeah. we're pretty busy here. We don't need that. It's just that select the case you're going to work in and do a good job from the beginning. Don't yeah. try something that you might not be able to finish it or you're going to finish it and it's not going to be that state of the art treatment and it might fail in the future. Right. And <laughs> give us give us a little perspective, maybe some examples like you and I talking about our dear friend Perez Shaw, who's already chimed in and he says, Rodrigo, nice tie. I still don't like doing endo. Now, a couple of years ago, he came to the conclusion that I just hate, and I don't know if you talked him into it, if, did you have an inter intervention with him or, <laughs> you know, what are some of this, what are some of the signs? Let's say I don't have the sheet from the AAE or it's just too laborious for me, or I don't, I just want to figure this out of myself. What would be some of the signs that you'd say, Hey, there, here's some considerations you want to, you want to use in this dilemma. Okay. Let me give you two good examples. One upper molars, maxillary molars. Those teeth, they are very difficult due to that high incidence of the MB2. Mm -hmm. And the MB2 is there. 90% yeah. of the cases, at least, the first maxillary molars, according to Stropko, and 60% of the second maxillary molars, they have the MB2. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think that's one of the cases. <coughs> should think twice if they don't have the appropriate technology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the technology would be the dental operating microscope or even the CBCT scan. Right, right. Now, let's say we don't have the technology because many of them don't. You know, is there anything you'd, you'd say about that? Because sometimes dentists, you know, you talked about the compounding debt and things like this. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of pressure to move – to go fully digital, you know, anything you would say about that particular journey that a young dentist who's watching this might be on? Well, uh, in 1999, I decided to buy my dental operating microscope. So I worked five years mm -hmm. just using my loops. And Kirk, it changed a lot the way I do endo. It changed. I said, wow, I felt like calling all my patients back and said, let me redo what I was doing. Yeah. It's all about how much you can see. So um, I, we are, I get referred lots of cases, maxillary molars, where the general dentist said, look, I couldn't find the MB2. Can you finish this treatment? Mm -hmm. When I remove the temporary filling and I put my microscope, I always tell them, you found the MB2. You just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So incorporating the right technology into your practice, it's going to make you tackle those cases and it's going to make you enjoy your practice. Right. Well, I worked with the dental operating microscope for until today. And I was like, I don't think there's anything out there that can change your practice like the dental operating microscope. Forget mm -hmm. it. There's nothing out there. Well, five years ago, I started using the CBCT scan. Mm -hmm. And it changed completely the way we do endo now. Yeah. Now we can do guided access opening. I can be more conservative. I can do a three-dimensional image of that tooth before I start my axis. And now I can guide my axis in a way where I'm preserving much more tooth structure. So I'm doing the same, removing much less. 
So if you ask me, what are the two pieces of technology that actually really makes a difference in your practice? In my point of view, it is magnification and illumination. That would be the microscope mm -hmm. and the three-dimensional image, the CBCT scan. Right. We've been having, I think since 1996, when Rotary started coming on board, 1995 maybe, Rotary started coming on board really hard. We have more than 80, more than 100 rotary or reciprocating systems out there, and our success rates are exactly the same. Right. So it doesn't matter how many systems they introduce, our success rate won't change. Yeah. You want to change your practice or the way you do window in order to enjoy it more. I have no doubt that magnification and illumination with a microscope and having a three-dimensional image using the CBCT scan, that's that's what I would strongly recommend as the most important piece of technology to enjoy endo in private practice. <clears throat> right, and then also, I would add also <coughs> having the, the support staff, the team around you too, because they need to be able to know what you're thinking. Now, I'm gonna ask you the controversial question. Now, I want you to answer this. You know, when you talk about success, you talk about predictability, we could easily go down this path. Do you think implants are more predictable than endo? You know, because, and, and it's a great debate. It's a wonderful debate. So I would love to know your perspective on that. Well, that that's a good question, Kurt. Well, my my question, my answer is absolutely not. Mm. Absolutely not. Uh, I today I have the clinical experience showing that endo is pretty successful mm -hmm. when well indicated. And I'll go back to this in a minute. Okay. And implants they fail, and mm -hmm. they fail more than what the industry shows us and throws it out there. If you ask someone the success rate of implants, they're going to show 97%, 99%, 95%. That data is not accurate. Actually, if you look at the literature and you look at really nice clinical studies, comparative studies, actually comparing apples and apples, orange and orange, I mean, you're going to see that the success rate of both are pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there's a nice study published in the Journal of the American Dental Association in 2014, where they looked at a group of practices where general dentists performed implants. And they looked at the success rate of that implant performed by general dentists. Success rate was close to 80%. Mm. The same group did the same study now, in order to evaluate the success rate of endodontics performed by general dentists, success rate close to 80%. Wow. So we have other studies comparing specialists doing endo and really high-notch specialists doing implants, and the success rate was around the 90% for both. If you want to know my opinion, when implants are well indicated, they will be successful. When endo is well indicated, will it will be successful as well. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that we have to look at endo is a lot of people do endo through crowns, endo without removing the whole filling. So you might be missing something out there. If you don't have an idea of what you have left, do we have enough ferrule? Do we have enough tooth structure? Can this mm -hmm. tooth be restored later? I think those questions have to be answered before we start the endo. So I think that's the major issue today. It's just if you do the endo without looking at how that tooth is going to be restored, when that tooth is going to be restored, I think those are two aspects that can put in jeopardy the success rate of endo. Okay? Right. Yeah, and I, I want you to speak about this too because there's a lot of truth to the stigma, the public stigma around, you know, I'd rather get a root canal. And really what happens too, I want you to speak about this because if the endo is not done correctly, it gives it a bad name all the way through. Do you know what I mean? Like it's 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 one of those things where it's got to be done over. It's got to be done the right way. Can you just speak to that? If it's not, it's almost like the foundation is just poorly done, which lends itself to all the other infrastructure problems that will start to ripple. So you're, you're, you watch this all the time. Give us some insight on that. Yeah. Well, when it comes to the perspective of the population out there, 
Yes, if it fails one, they lose the, the, the they they Endo loses the credibility towards them. Right. So when they come to you, and now you have to retreat, the first question you're asked is, okay, if it failed once, who can guarantee this is not going to fail twice? Right. And right. the funny thing is, going back to predictability, if you look at the research studies, the success rate of a retreatment is lower than the initial treatment. So it's pretty accurate. It's pretty awkward when you look at the patient. Look, you're going to have to pay more for a retreatment, but now I'm going to offer you a success rate lower than the first treatment you had. Right. So if you're going to do it, do it right the first time. Yeah. Uh, going back to the example, if you can't negotiate, it, can I stop? At that point, refer. If you can't find an MB2, stop, refer. Don't finish the treatment. Don't wait for it to fail several years later and then, re and then send it. Um, so basically, it's uh, all about, uh, is this case suitable for me? Do I have the appropriate technology to tackle this case? Or should I be stepping out and just referring from the beginning? Yeah, and I, you and I are totally on the same page. We were talking about this before. There's no less expensive way to do anything than to do it the right way the first time. You know, so and you could apply that to almost anything in the world. When you do it the right way the first time, it's everything is just better. And I completely agree. Now, when you talk about case selection, I want to introduce how much, how, what, you know, because some, what about patient selection with case selection? Because there's crazy people out there. There are, like, give us some insight from an endodontist when you know case selection, you know, this might be a good case, but not the best patient. Can you give us a little perspective on that? Sure. Yeah. Well, base, patient selection, one, one, patient or a, a typical patient that can make your endo miserable it's the gagger mm -hmm. if the patient is a gagger you're, you're going to have a tough time talking to this patient and making your treatment work taking radiographs it's going to be extremely difficult anxious patients patients that need oral sedation patients that need nitrous so those are patients that you want to think twice Patients that are extremely anxious, they want to—they don't want to be in your chair for two and a half hours. They don't want to see that you're struggling. If they see that things are going, um, not going the way they expect, then things go downhill immediately. Um, patients that, um, for an example, patients that had several cases that were treated and still have pain. Today we have several cases of non-odontogenic pain that are referred to the teeth. And mm -hmm. patients come to your practice, you can't come up to the correct diagnosis, and you end up doing endo just for the sake of doing endo, and the patient comes back, I still feel pain on that too. So patients that have been through several treatments and haven't had the success they expected, those are complicated patients. Again, the gagger, patients that are extremely anxious, I think those are the ones that when it comes to that assessment of the case, those are the ones that I think should be referred as well, uh, because there are not cases where you're going to enjoy endo for sure. Right. Now, I don't know if you get these questions, but I get these questions. So I'm just going to ask you, you know, when you see a young dentist and they're doing endodontics, the, the whole landscape changes when they're heavy PPO. You know, I know some endodontists and they're incredible and they're in fee-for-service environments and not a dime of insurance. Like, tell us what you see and what are some considerations when you're considering those different landscapes in endodontics from what you see? What do you mean? What do you mean with PPO? Well, they're just doing a lot of insurance. You know, it's, it's a heavy insurance-based environment and... Um, you know, it's completely different than an endodontist who doesn't work. I mean, there are some endodontists, I know one in New York City. I mean, he only sees four or five maybe three patients a day as where an endodontist might see another one on the other end of the scope with a heavy insurance environment or even a GP in a heavy insurance environment. And you're talking about a speed that's much faster. And what are some considerations that we would, you know, would be good to think about in those two environments? That's a good question. Uh, again, it comes back to case selection. If you're seeing easy cases, you might be able to do six, seven, eight cases a day. Mm -hmm. For a, for an endodontics practice, a specialist practice, for us, it's not rare to have an average of four to five patients a day. 
Right. Because the, 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 the difficulty of the case is much higher than what you would expect. We have a lot of retreatments. You might have surgeries. You might have calcified canals, uh, ledges that were created previously. So those cases demand more time. Um, just to have uh, used me as an example, the average amount of patients I'd see a day is between four to five cases a day. And okay. then we always put into that a couple of consults, uh, checks uh, in the morning, a couple of consults, checks in the afternoon as well. Uh, but again, it all depends on how difficult the case is. I don't think it's, it's humanly possible to do 10, 12 cases a day. This is me. I, I wouldn't be able to do it, especially if they're molars. I mean, you can do it. I just don't see quality there. Mm-hmm. This is me. And if you want to talk about controversy, that's one of them. I'm sure a lot of people there are going to get upset at me, but it doesn't work. It doesn't. Right. Because I've done that. I've done seven, eight, nine cases a day. And I wouldn't like to be my ninth case. I wouldn't like to be my 10th case. Right. So today I try to have between four to five cases a day. And I think that's enough in order to come up with the good quality treatment for the patient. And again, I don't want to see that patient again, tapping on that tooth, saying the tooth still hurts. I think keeping my 10% failures is enough to give me a lot of headaches. So I'm good with that. Yeah. Now you get to see a lot of great young dentists and even mature dentists come through your training. What are some of the pitfalls that you would just say, be careful of this? Well, um, I think the the most important thing is screen the case. And yeah. what happens with them is sometimes they don't spend too much time looking at the radiograph. The radiograph can tell us so much when you see that abrupt interruption in the radiolucency. That tells you there's two canals out here that's going to mm-hmm. split in two canals. I think that when I ask them, what are you here for? In my courses, what are you here for? I think 80% of them is, I want to be, I want to do endo faster. That's the first thing they ask. Second, I want to find that MB2 and negotiate the MB2. Mm-hmm. And third, uh, but the majority of them is, look, I just want to be efficient. I want to be able to do everything in one visit. I want to be efficient, but also be successful. Yeah. That's awesome. Now we got a question here. I'm, I'm going to give it to you. What are your thoughts on X Guide 3D Dynamic and True Vision 3D? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that's something extremely new. I think that it's it's coming with promising results, and it's going to be able to give you a nice idea how your access should be designed. It's going to give you actually a guide, so you can access through that guide and reach your canal preserving much more tooth structure. Clinically, I don't have any experience with that yet, but I've seen some cases through the internet, and it looks interesting. Again, we have to see it clinically how it's going to work. I don't think anything is perfect until 70% of the endodontists are using it. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to go slowly. We have to see if it really works as it shows. It is promising, but... Clinically, I don't have any experience with that yet. Yeah. Now, I am going to ask you this, too, and everyone can only um, guess what the future looks like. You're pretty involved with some amazing high-level guys, and you get to see the technology. What do you anticipate Endo is going to look like in the next two, three years, just with the advancements in the digital workflow? I mean, it's anyone's best guess, but I would love to know what you think it'll look like two, three, four years from now. I think that, again, with the CBCT and the, and the dental operating microscope, I think that it really changed the way we do endo. Mm-hmm. And I think the future of endodontics, it's going to be coming with instruments, coming up with instruments that are going to allow us to be minimally invasive. So right. I think that one of the main reasons for failure, for the treatment failure, is vertical root fracture. And we've been in fault for so many years, enlarging those axes like crazy, uh, having those huge tapered canals. So I think the future of endodontics is going to be to go less invasive. And yes, using the 3D technology for sure is going to help us uh, achieve that goal. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, And we could only 
only guess what this is going to look like in the future. Um, you know, and the other thing I, I, I'm curious about, when you see young dentists going down the endo path or even being an endodontist, what are some lessons you know for sure? Because I love talking to the endodontists. You know, you see endodontists have been doing this for a long time. They always come to some really strong conclusions. They go, look, I'm just going to tell you up front. You find that they're more confident in their decision. What are some of those things that you would you would say you've learned or things you would, you know, give to a young person going down the path of doing endo? I'm biased. I love endo, right? Yeah. Right? So I, I think it was the best decision I've made. But what I usually tell some of my former students when they ask me, look, I want to apply for an endo school. What do you think? The first question I ask is, are you passionate about endo? Do you right. really love endo? Because one thing is to do an endo or two a week in dental school. The other thing is to do four or five cases a day in private practice. And don't forget, 85% of the endos done in North America are done by general dentists. Mm. So the other 15% that are referred off, those are the really tough cases. So your private practice is going to be built on tough cases, tough patients. And in order to enjoy that, you really have to love what you do. If you have the passion, Kurt, you, you lace it. There's no way it can go bad. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. But right. you're always going to enjoy it. You're going to take lessons from the cases you fail. But you're still going to enjoy it. I enjoy every day in my practice. There are days where I come home exhausted, mm -hmm. but I enjoyed it. Um, this is something that I like to do, and I would strongly advise young dentists to do it. And I do it until today. I had a sheet where I had, I think, for more than 10 years, Kirk, more than 10 years, I had the tooth that I, ju that I just treated, and I had two columns there. Okay. What went well, what didn't go well. Love that. I did that exercise for so long. Today, I don't do it in writing, but I did it for so long that when I look at a radiograph, I immediately see, okay, I didn't like this. This didn't go well. This went well. And if it didn't go well, why didn't it go well? What yeah. should I do different next time? I think when you do that exercise, and you're not afraid to do it because we don't want to look at our mistakes. We don't want to look when something goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I tell everyone, you want to be 100% successful in endo, don't take the final radiograph, Yeah, right? That's when it's going to show you so how you're treating. Yeah. So. I look at my final radiograph and I look at everything. I think my axis was too big. I think I'm a little bit short in this route. Oh, I think I'm a little bit long in this one. I think my prep is a little bit too tapered. I think I should have used the gate splint. I shouldn't have used the gate splint so much. So I start criticizing myself and you have to be open to that. Yeah. As soon as you do that, you're going to become more picky with your cases. And I tell them, pursue perfection. You're never going to reach it, but you're right. going to be really good. Trust me. You're going to be really good. So that's what you want. You want to look at why it failed. I don't want to repeat the same mistakes, even though sometimes we do it. And you want to take a lesson from it. Yeah. When the case goes beautiful and everything goes well, you keep that in your mind for minutes and hours. Mm. When something goes bad, you sleep over it. You wake up in the morning. The first thing that comes to your head is that radiograph. So yeah. instead of hammering yourself, just take a home lesson, learn from it, and try not to repeat the same mistake. So that having that little sheet where you write what went well, you have to find something that went well. I mean, you have to be You have to. Well. Oh. Yeah. But also looking at what didn't go well and what should I do in order to avoid this in the future, I think this is gold. Yeah, Rodrigo, it is, it's platinum what you just said, because, you know, it's cliche to make a mistake once, that's okay, but to repeat it is just stupid, and you you can make yourself crazy, and some people keep repeating the same mistakes, so, and we don't really often take enough time to pause and do some real-time learning, say, hey, look, um, ooh, that was not good. I always love the, the phrase, instead of being frustrated, be fascinated, go, wow, that really didn't go well. Ooh, why not? And then analyze. I think your 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 system is beautiful. So I totally, totally agree, my friend. And then also, too, got a couple other comments here. Mark Rick said, hey, Dr. Kuna Messi is the best soccer player in soccer history. So I, I'm guessing you're an unbelievable soccer player, right? 
I never heard of Messi. Next question. <laughs> okay, Deepak asked this question. Great question on the referral topic. Now, when you get a referral from a general dentist, what info, either clinical or non-clinical, do you wish uh, they would routinely provide to make life easier to affect a better patient care or result? What What are some of the things that you wish you had for to to improve the referral process? Great question. Okay, before we go back to that question, just I made fun of Messi. I'm from Brazil. Yeah. Messi's from Argentina. Soccer, <laughs> Brazil, Argentina doesn't go well, right? No, so, right. Uh, so as a good Brazilian soccer fan, we will never accept that an, an Argentinian yeah. player is better than a Brazilian player. So I'm glad you gave yeah. some clarification to that. <laughs> okay, so your question is, what would I do to increase the referral basis? That's what you asked? Well, what information, let's say from a general dentist, you know, either clinical or non-clinical, do you wish they would provide to give you a better result, you know, for the patient care? Um, what, what, what do you, what would be ideal that you would get from a GP to improve the result? Well, the more history about the case they can give us, the better it is. Okay. So, uh, a good quality radiograph is always good, but you know what? I don't mind the radiograph because I like to take my own anyway. And today we do a CBCT scan. So the radiograph is interesting just for us to look at the case, but the history of the case is important. Second, super important piece of information. What is going to be the restorative component for that case? How right. are you restoring that case? And when are you restoring that case? This is super important. So um, not only prepare for the post, but which post are you putting in? Uh, when are you placing that post? Are you building a core? Uh, do you have enough ferrule? Has this tooth been assessed regarding restorability? This is paramount. Why? Sometimes you get cases that are referred to us. Please do access through a crown. You do the endo through the crown, which I'm not 100% in favor, and we can talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. You do the endo through the crown. The patient goes back to the referring dentist, and the crown pops off after a month. And now he realizes there's not enough feral to save that tooth. And now, so why did you refer this for a root canal treatment? This should have been assessed beforehand. Right. So for general dentists, I think that assessing the restorability before referring to an endodontist, this is important. Remove the carry. Remove the old filling. Put something temporary there, but assess. Look what you have left there, and if you can work with that before we do the root canal. If you need help assessing the restorability, that's one thing, and endodontists are there to help you assessing the restorability, giving you our perspective regarding this case. But asking endodontists to assess restorability, that doesn't make sense. Because right. why am I going to assess the restorability if you are going to restore that tooth? You should assess the restorability. If the tooth is restorable, now you should be referring for the endo. Yeah, absolutely. Do you agree with me or do you think this is too controversial? I, no, I think it's great, you know, because I look at the referral process and you sometimes you don't even get any information no, at all. No, sometimes it comes perform endo 16. Yeah, yeah, and so you're like, can you tell me? What are you going to do with this case? Why are you doing endo in this case? Uh, have you noticed that there's a crack in the distal margin? Yes or no? Those are all important. And then it makes communication harder. If you assess that, I'm not going to quote names, but we have a, no, I am going to quote names because he's a great general dentist, but we have a general dentist here in Winnipeg called uh, Dr. Tseng, and he's a great example for that. His cases, he just removes everything. He cleans it all out. He assesses restorability. Paresh does the same thing. He looks at it, he assesses the restorability, so he assessed it beforehand. Look, it is restorable. You can perform the endo because I assess the restorability already, and right. as soon as you finish, I am sure, I am confident that I can restore this tooth in a proper manner. Right, right, right. I love that. You know, and sometimes we, you know, I love what you say, the history. I want to know the story behind the patient. We could talk about structure, function, biology, aesthetics, all that kind of, but who is, why is she 
why are, why is she here? What's the purpose? Because it only gives you the tools that you need. And we can get into this in later episodes, but I love some of the best that I see, like Dr. Christopher Ramsey. I love how he'll take such he'll take a movie of the entire case, what he's thinking, and he'll send it to the referring end of, you know, the referred and the end of us love it because there's so much clarity, there's perspective behind the story. He talks about the restorability. It's beautiful, and now we're all on the same page. And I, I totally agree. The more information you have better. Now, I want to go back to the question you said, endo through the crown. Let's go there. You know, I, I love having this debate. Now, we don't have to upset anybody or anything like that, but I want to see it through the eyes of an endodontist. Talk about endo through the crown. Okay. Well, endo through a crown, yeah, it is controversial. The, the question is, why are we doing endo through a crown? Right. The, the answer is financial purpose, right? I'm doing endo through a crown because the patient doesn't want to lose that crown. It's going to be cheaper for them. Okay, let's say you placed that crown a month ago. You prepped the tooth, you placed the crown, everything looks great, the margins look good, and unfortunately, the tooth blew up. It's not, you know, it's pulpitic or there's a symptomatic apical periodontitis and the patient needs a root canal. Right. I'm going to do my best to do the endo through the crown. I am going to be as conservative as I can, so then you can fill the axis and let's make that work. Okay. Scenario B, the crown has been there for 15 years. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see, I mean, even though from the outside you can't see a leaky margin, when you access that tooth and you see those brown, purple walls, it leaked. So I'm going to do the endo through the crown. I can't see properly. I can see even with a microscope, I might miss a crack. Sometimes I can't clean the caries the way it should be because if I'm going to keep my axis small, I'm not going to be able to clean all that caries. If I'm going to enlarge my axis in a way that I'm going to clean all the caries, now the crown is gone. So it comes to that dilemma, what am I going to do? So in those cases, and Paul Abbott has a really nice study where he asked his, his students to do axis through crown in previous fillings and look for caries, marginal breakdowns, and uh, cracks. So they did their access, preserving uh, old fillings, crowns. After they looked at the numbers, he said, okay, now remove everything and let's reassess. Mm -hmm. I don't have the numbers on the top of my head. One number I have, marginal breakdown, 99.6% after they removed everything. And it was close wow. to 60 before they removed. They saw a significant increase in the amount of cracks when they removed the previous fillings and crowns. So every time we are thinking about preserving a crown, we should talk to the patient. The risks of having that crown there. And I'm not saying all crowns should be removed, but mm -hmm. if the crown has been there for 15 years and it failed for some reason, if the tooth got necrotic and now there is a lesion, it leaked from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do my root canal and you're going to fill it, the leakage is there still. We right. haven't closed the tap. So it's going to leak and my endo is going to fail after five, six, ten years. So in those cases, I think it's mandatory to remove the crown, assess what's underneath, clean the caries, uh, clean the whole tissue, assess if there's a crack, again, assess the restorability, and then do the endo. For insurance purpose, if the patient can't put a crown on the same year, Build a nice permanent core, put a temporary crown there, and wait a little bit and then put a permanent crown. But don't leave the leaky crown there because mm -hmm. that's only contributing to leakage and it's going to contaminate the root canal that was previously done. Right. I think what it all comes back to is you're working with other people in dentistry that all have the same core values because I you could I could see where the, this can get a very, become a very dicey conversation because if you and I don't believe the same thing we're not going to get anywhere you know as long as the the patient is the best interest and you and I believe the same thing um, we're in good shape so it's a great question now I I get we're getting a lot of questions this is such great stuff Rodrigo I really appreciate it. nice to see you Rodrigo this is from Raymond Zhu he says what's your stance on endodontists restoring their own cases you know so I want to know what's your thought on that because I'm, I'm guessing there's a whole story there but tell me tell me yeah. how you'd respond to that well I think that uh, if you know what you're doing and you know how if you can perform a good 
uh, if you can be also a good restorative dentist, I don't see any reason why not, as long as there is good communication between you and your referring dentist. Mm -hmm. uh, if the patient, if there's only an occlusal access, something really simple that you just have to fill that occlusal access, I don't see why not. Uh, for more complex cases, if the endodontist is not 100% confident, be sure that the general dentist is going to see that patient soon. But I'm not against uh, endodontists filling the, their own access. For sure, I'm not against. I think that if they can do a good job, I think they should be doing it for sure. Yeah. And Raymond is a good clinician, um, and I'm sure he agrees with me. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people agree with you. You got Ruth Greco. I ab I agree with Dr. Cunha uh, from Paraguay. So you got you got quite the following, my friend. So this is good stuff. Any other last things you just say on the uh, the entire scope of of endo and just what we uh, what we're looking at here in the, in the future? Well, again, uh, I think that. Today, I think the best way to practice is through an interdisciplinary standpoint, right? Yes. So uh, that's why we were talking how important it is to get as much as information from the referring dentist. Depending on the case, it's super important to have a periodontist on board and having him see if there's any crown lengthening that has to be done. So I like to call the referring dentist. I like to talk. I like to discuss the case. Because the worst thing, and I've done this already, is to do an endo and have the patient coming back saying, I don't know why you did this. They're going to extract this tooth next week. And that was lack of communication. So I think having endodontists inserted into an interdisciplinary context, I think that's going to be the future. I mean, you can't work isolated anymore. Right. Um, I am also blessed to work in a private practice where we work. I work with other five endodontists. But once, I wore, uh, once a week, I work in a practice where there are 20 general dentists. Wow. In one practice. And I'm the only endodontist. But I'm spoiled here because I just have to stand up, go to the other one's chair and say, look, come here, help me with this. Or, what right. are you planning to do? This? And I don't know how many cases that communication s covered me for sure because I was up to do something where – probably that tooth wasn't going to be saved in the future. So mm -hmm. that interdisciplinary approach is the future. Um, and I think that's what we should be looking at for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I completely agree with you. I believe in it. And it really comes down to this. As you age, you realize you can't do everything and you only do a few things well and you find more joy staying in your circle, whatever your circle is. So I love your exercises and actually I'm going to adopt them quite a few for, uh, for what we're going to do now. I know we're going to have you back on other things. I've got so many exciting things uh, that uh, we've been planning behind the scenes. We're going to kind of keep that a little bit secret here, but uh, I, I know people are going to want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Now you do not, you don't have a website. Do you? Dexter, I you, don't, I don't. You don't. <laughs> like you're the only person in the world that doesn't have a, have a website, right? I don't, but you know what? I think today Facebook works almost as well as a website and I have my email, yeah. uh, but I'm going to work on my website soon. Yeah, for sure. So if people want to get a hold of you, how can they get a hold of you? Um, email, I'm fine. Uh, it's rodrigo.endodontics at gmail.com and everyone can find me on Facebook, Rodrigo Sanchez Cunha, and for sure we can chat. Yeah, buddy, I really enjoy this. And someday you're going to bring me to Brazil and we're going to have a meal done. I hear the food is amazing. Is that true? Oh, it's and not only the food. Everything there is great. We can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should go. We should go. Well, yeah, we'll have a good sure. time, buddy. Well, I, I am so incredibly grateful. So thank you for carving out some time. I know you're a busy, busy guy. Uh, and I know people got a ton of value out of this. So stay on for just a second while we say goodbye to everybody. But here's what I want to say. If you're watching this and you have a question, please add it to the feed. And Rodrigo will get back to you and uh, we'll, we'll give you a get you the answers that you that you need and we are and if you enjoyed today please do this hit the share button and share it with your friends we always love when you do that uh and then uh keep watching the best best practice show we're so incredibly grateful so you guys have a great evening thank you so much thank you